Good morning, friends. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. Today is the final Sunday of the month of October. Today's a very special day in the life of the church. Today is Reformation Sunday. In 1517, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the, to the wall door of Castle Church in Whitburg, and the Protestant Reformation began. This morning when I came to church, I was grateful that I did not see any complaints nailed to the Book of Lords. So all's well for another year. It's good to have you on this very special day. Let me share a few things in the life of our church today. From 2 to 4 p.m., we will be gathering with children from our church, and we will be having a big fall event. From 2 to 3 in the first hour, we'll have a teaching and some games and activities, kids are encouraged to dress up in positive costumes. And then from three to four, we'll be going out to the parking lot and we're gonna be decorating cars for trunk or treat. So that's always a very special time with our children. There'll be dozens of children here. So please be in prayer. Of course, you're invited to come out from three to four as well today. Also want to mention that we are now we're going to be offering poinsettias for Christmas, and we have an order form out in the welcome area. If you'd like to order one and honor a memory of a loved one for Christmas, deadline to order would be next Sunday. So if you'd like more information, you can get that after the service at the welcome desk or call the church office tomorrow and be happy to, to do that for you. We've also provided some printed copies of our news Last that went out this week. Every week we've been sending a weekly news update, newsletter through email, and we are also providing a printed copy for those not on the email list or those who do not have internet. Here at the church, we have those copies at the welcome desk as well today. Well, in honor of Reformation Day, we're going to sing Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We also will be hearing it a couple times. We'll be hearing it in the prelude and in the postlude. And so let us now join together in worship.
rise for the call to worship from Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And our first hymn is A Mighty Fortress is Our God, number 110 in the hymn. we go to the Lord in prayer, I want to welcome our visitors worshiping with us today. If you're a first time visitor, we're glad you're here. We have a small gift bag for you. If you would like to come to the welcome desk right out in the cafe after the service, we'd be happy to share that with you, but we're glad you're here today. Also, uh, every week we share in an offering. Um, there's coming a time very soon that we're going to be 
passing the plates again and taking the offering in the service. But we do take an offering every week by the boxes at the doors. I invite you to participate in that or, of course, to send in your gift as a way to worship. This week, we want to remember the family of Dwayne Johnson. Dwayne went to be with the Lord this past week, and we will celebrate his life in the sanctuary here as we hold a memorial service next Saturday, November the 6th. November the 6th at 11 a.m. Visitation will be from 9 a.m. till 11 with the service at 11. Dwayne was a faithful choir member, and we're grateful for all of his love for the church and love for the Lord over the years. So we pray for his family. We also want to remember to pray for our community and pray for our nation. This week will be another election day, and so I want to encourage you to get out to vote this week on Tuesday, but we'll hold each other and all the candidates in prayer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Eternal and loving God, we come this morning from different places around the community and even a few, perhaps from longer distances, into this place to acknowledge your presence, your goodness, and your love for not just the world, but for each of us very personally. We're thankful for the ways in which you're doing a new work in the church at each time and season. We're thankful for great leaders in the past, like Martin Luther, who gave them vision to be truthful to your word and your will. Help us to be faithful in our hour of history as well. We're reminded this morning in Ezekiel chapter 11, 19, that you promised to give us one heart and new spirit, and that you'll take away from us hearts of stone and give us tender hearts of love for you so we can obey your commandments. So this morning we pray that you'll melt any old part of us that's bitter or indifferent to others, and you'll give us an open mind and an open heart and an open door to receive you and your people on this day. We think of those in our congregation in need of your touch, those in the nursing homes today, and those who've been in the hospital. We pray your healing and your helping touch to be upon those with special needs. Help those who are grieving in the loss of a loved one, especially the Johnson family. And Lord, as we think about the Ten Commandments, we acknowledge we live in a time of wishy-washy beliefs, in a culture where absolutes seem very few and far between. We're thankful for your clarity that you give to us and the guidelines for living that we call the Ten Commandments. Help us to see that not for our harm, but for our help, and that you're Dividing away to a good life. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. You taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Each and every week we are blessed to have different individuals and small groups provide special music and we're in for a blessing today and so we welcome the group that's going to be singing today.
Today's scripture are from two places, Exodus 20, verse 15, and Ephesians 4, verse 28. First from Exodus, do not steal. And from Ephesians, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. May God bless the reading of his word. We started this sermon series several weeks ago, back at the beginning of September, and I pray that it's been a blessing for you as it has been for me as we've been looking every single week at a different commandment of the Ten Commandments. We're almost through. We've got just a couple more to go. We're on commandment eight of ten. And it's a simple one. It's a commandment, not simply to Judaism and Christianity, but it's one that's found in all kinds of different societies and certainly religions as a universal law. But certainly it speaks to us here and speaks to our age. And it's simply this from Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. You shall not steal. You shall not steal. Now, once in a while, I enjoy hearing about and reading about dumb robber stories. Um, I just find them fascinating and they're worth a good chuckle. And I heard a story a long time ago about a, uh, heard about this dumb robber in Seattle, downtown Seattle. He decided that he was going to steal some gasoline out of an RV. And so what he did, he took a hose and he thought he would siphon the gas out of this mobile home. And uh, it was actually an RV, not a mobile home. And so he started, he realized he had made the mistake because he had stuck the hose in the sewer tank instead of the gas tank. Well, the uh, owner, when he found out, decided not to press charges. He thought the guy was punished enough, and, and so he didn't. Well, have you ever had something stolen from you? How does that make you feel? My dad's house got robbed in 2012. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So you, it, it makes you angry, doesn't it? Yes. When someone breaks in. Yes. Well, tell me about it later. A security system. No, you have a security. Does it work? Yep. Okay. I just put, I just put a security system in when I, when I moved into my house on okay. the lower avenue, my mom's house. I'm getting my own apartment soon. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for sharing that. So how many else have had some? Thing happened. Let's just do a survey here, since Griffin shared. Anybody here, let's say, have you ever had um, money stolen from you? Anyone had money? How'd that make you feel, okay? Anybody have a bicycle stolen from you? What about a car? Have you ever had your car broken into? Anyone here? I know when we first moved to Grove City years ago, we had someone break into our car, and our house sits back from the road. What was really scary is they stole our garage door opener at the time, so we had to change all that. How many have ever had their house, Griffin mentioned his house, a house broken into? Well, how does that make you feel, right? You feel violated, you feel angry, right? You feel very mad. Heard about a guy that was so mad that he put up a sign on his property that said, warning, this property is now protected by a mean pit bull with AIDS. I mean, he wasn't happy. So that's a warning protected by security system. Security system, okay. So you understand. And uh, it makes you feel angry as well. And let me ask you another question. I want you to be equally honest. Have you ever stolen something that didn't belong to you? Okay, maybe it was in the distant past. You know, I send out pastor chats every week, and I mentioned that I just recently heard from ABC News a survey in which they surveyed a, uh, 2,000 parents of, of children ages 3 to 15. 66% said that they had at one time or another stolen their children's Halloween candy. <laughs> So let's just be honest with a show of hands. I mean, just us, we're family here. How many can honestly say, of course, way back in the distant past, <laughs> that you've stolen a piece of candy, or maybe you picked an apple from someone else's orchard without asking, or maybe it was a grape from the produce section of the grocery store, or maybe it was 
you grabbed a plate at the salad bar and you made an unpaid trip to the salad bar. Anybody here ever want to met? Let's just, come on, let's be honest, raise your hand. Okay, now we've just taken a picture and the Grove City Police will be calling you. Just kidding, all right, just kidding. Well, there's something inside of us that longs to get something for nothing. Maybe that's why the lottery is so popular. We love to have a bag of money fall from the sky. Before I look at the scripture, Mark read another illustration I told years ago. My sister actually had literally money fall from the sky. My sister Holly, it was nearly 30 years ago, in the early 90s, she was driving up south of the road along the Muskingum River towards Zanesville, and a car came out from the road, and she noticed this briefcase came out from the car, and all of a sudden, it hit the ground and it opened up, and all this money started scattering everywhere. I mean, bills were flying. She realized that they were all $20 bills. <laughs> so she stopped the car, but the car didn't stop, and it kept going on. So she started picking up, and she collected $360. Also, in the briefcase, she found divorce papers. She found um, a new bank card and a magazine. Now, let me just pause right here. Put yourself in her shoes. What would you have done? Now, would you have said, thank you, Jesus, you just answered my prayer? <laughs> or would you have said, finders, keepers, losers, weepers? <laughs> well, she did do the right thing. This, these were the days where they used to put the address of someone on the magazine. Remember when they would put that, you could find their mailing address, and she found the mail, and she found out who it was. It was actually a local attorney he had placed his briefcase up on top of the car roof, and he had driven off. And have you ever put maybe a coffee mug up there or whatever? And so, so that's what happened. He was so grateful. I asked her, did she get an award? She got a small award, but it wasn't the three hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> we all want something for nothing, but we live in an age where there's no such thing as a free lunch. So the Eighth Commandment speaks to that. It's forbidding not the acquiring of wealth, but getting it where we don't deserve to. Now, there are ways that we acquire wealth according to the Bible. That's through good old-fashioned hard work. It's through investing, and also perhaps through inheritance or gift. Now, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Apostle Paul writing the church in Ephesus and he says this, he or she who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. So how do we acquire wealth? We acquire wealth through good old fashioned work or through investing, and the Bible tells us to do that. So this commandment is a general commandment, most of us would agree, I'd say there'd be some people say, well, I've never broken this, so let's check this and move on. We all know that bank robbery is wrong. You know, I heard a year ago, there was, at least it was reported in the paper that carjackings were up a year ago in our area. And we all know that's wrong, breaking in a home. But are there less obvious ways to steal? Hmm. What about stealing from a business, shoplifting? It's easy to have a Robin Hood mentality. Take from the rich, give to the poor. And so we get into our mind, well, this big business that makes millions or billions of dollars like Walmart or Target, they're not gonna miss one piece of gum. They're not gonna miss a pencil or, or our employer. A lot of thefts actually from employees. Have you ever been in a situation where you knew that there were people stealing? I remember in college, I worked in a grocery store and I could not believe how many employees would steal food. And they would justify it by saying, well, we work here, it's free food. I'm thinking, it's not free food. And so we have that in our society. Sometimes people steal from their employer by not working and saying that they're working. Um, calling in sick when they're not sick. And that's probably why a lot of companies have gone to PTO time, personal time off, because in having um, sick days, people would just call in sick. I heard about this one guy 
who wanted his wife to call in for him, but he was sick and she didn't want to do it. He said, well, you're not sick. You want to go fishing. He said, well, could you do it? And she wouldn't do it. So he decided he was going to call in. He was just going to try to raise his voice, you know, in a higher pitch. Maybe his boss wouldn't know. And so he called in and he said, hello, in a high voice like this. George won't be in today. He's sick. And the boss said, who's this? And he says, this is my wife. <laughs> Let that sink in for a moment. What about cutting corners or fudging on taxes? That's stealing from the government. Happens every year. You say, well, I don't believe everything the government does. Well, who does? But then we enjoy the public roads. Someone maintains those potholes. We want our kids to be educated well. Some are older, enjoy Medicare and other supplemental help. Or we want the fire and police department to help us or the military to protect us, right? Look what it says in Romans chapter 13, verse seven. Let's read this together so I won't know I'm all alone here. Let's read it together. Give everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and import duties. Give respect and honor to all to whom it is due. So we are to not steal from the government. And then finally this, this is a shorter sermon today, which I think you'll be glad. And I always like to say, don't worry, I can always make it up later. <laughs> but I just have one other area and then we'll move on. Do you know it's possible to rob from God? You say, no, I would never do that. But it happens. Serving as a Methodist superintendent for several years, I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly. I saw the best in people, and I saw, unfortunately, the worst in people. And I saw a lot of great things, but I also, working in that administrative position, saw a lot of corruption within churches. Some, there were many good people who just, over time, had compromised to a place that they didn't want to be anymore. Every year in churches, there are embezzlements, stealing from God's work. We had a couple of those pretty major ones in Columbus during my time. Now I was serving Southeast Ohio, I was aware of these going on, but in my own district, I had three churches over seven years that the treasurer embezzled money. And each one I had to go as superintendent to meet with the church boards and to meet with those individuals. And it was always sad. And, you know, in every case, it was different, but these people did not set out to say, I'm going to steal from the church. They were trusted people within the church. In fact, in one situation, the person had been part of the church since childhood. They were well-loved and they were trusted. And therefore, the church, being a little smaller church, did not have the checks and balances because they just trusted this person. I mean, this person would never do anything to hurt the church. They were a lay member at annual conference as well. But over time, they got so much power of making decisions without the board that they started spending money in different ways and even for personal family gain. And I remember as we sat in the house with this person, and also the pastor and others, and through the tears, and the church was to the point, they were upset that they were willing to forgive. But the county had stepped in and the sheriff's department and the county prosecutor and said no, because of the amount of money that this person will need to be tried, and they did, and they went to prison. Now there's a good news, redemptive side to this story is that after she was out of prison, went for two years up to Marion, she came back into the community and the church accepted her fully into the community and into the church. Now she's no longer the treasurer. <laughs> No longer the treasure, but that's grace. You say, I would never do that. How could anyone steal from God? The life giver, the salvation giver, the heaven giver. I would never do that. And yet one of the passages that comes to mind from the Old Testament, the Lord spoke to the prophet Malachi and said, well, may and rob from God, and yet you rob me. But you say, well, how do you, we rob you in tithes and offerings? See, there's no such thing as a self-made man, a self-made woman, because everything that we have 
is because God gave us the ability to get out of bed this morning. God gives us the ability to have the mind to work. God surrounded us through our lives with individuals or teachers who shaped us and molded us and everything that we have. And the fact is, we'll all leave it behind anyway. We're having a funeral next week, and I was like, thought, you know, I've never seen a hearse pull in a U-Haul. <laughs> we don't take it with us. So all we are are trustees. We're stewards for a period of time of what we have. It's all really God's. And God's entrusted us. And so we're blessed to be a blessing. See, if Jesus is not the Lord of all, then he's not the Lord at all. Let me say it again. If Jesus is not the Lord of all, then he's not the Lord of your life at all. Now, since we clarified in different ways we can steal, and I think in some ways, if we look back at our life, all of us have violated the Eighth Commandment, including the preacher. And I think what we've seen in all these commandments, when you take them to a higher level through the ethical lens of Jesus, that all of us have been guilty. But there's an interesting thing that a thief can do that sometimes other sins we can't do. I mean, two weeks ago we dealt with murder, and although we can be forgiven of that, you can't bring a person back to life if you've taken a person's life. Or adultery, you can be forgiven, but there's still those scars and the memories of the past. But a thief can do something. A thief can change. A thief can make things right. A thief can have restitution. There was a guy in the Bible in the New Testament named Zacchaeus. Remember him? Who was Zacchaeus? He was an ancient Roman IRS agent. <laughs> but he had been stealing money from people. He had been charging them too much. And he was using it for personal gain. But Jesus came to his house. And Jesus showed him a better way to live. And his life was changed. And not only was he forgiven, but he paid back not just the amount, but even more to be a blessing to others. Finally, this is because do you remember that one day Jesus turned to a guy, to another guy, and he said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. It was on a Friday, a week called good. Do you know who that guy was? He was a thief on the cross next to him. But God's grace is greater than our sin. It's good enough and great enough to change us from the inside out. And so as Jesus turned towards this guy, he turned towards Jesus. And we can do that today too. That's why our final song is turn your eyes upon Jesus, to look full into his wonderful face. Lord Jesus, today that's what we do. We turn our eyes upon you. He who has been stealing must steal no more, your word says. Very clear. And so we just put all the past and the memories behind us. We ask that you'll cover that with your blood. If we need, need to make restitution or peace, we do that as well. We ask God that we'll be faithful to you in our moment of history as we turn our eyes towards you. Thank you for your Ten Commandments to speak to us today, to our life, and to our society. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing. This little chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let's sing it twice. It's really short. If you're following in a hymnal, it's hymn number 349. The words will be on the screen, but let's sing it through twice. Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
before we receive the benediction, I want to thank you for coming out today. I pray that you'll have a blessed day. Please remember to pray for our children as we'll be gathering here this afternoon for a big event. Allow me to share as we close words of benediction from the end of June. We haven't shared this benediction for a while, so I want to share this that you might be blessed. Starting in verse 24 from the scripture. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, with glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.